Good morning and welcome to Koinonia Church Online. We are so glad that you're with us this morning. And if you haven't yet, just take a second, hop on that chat and just uh, send a hello or a wave. We'd love to connect together in that way. Um, also, if you have a prayer request, you can go ahead and click that prayer request button at any time and someone from our team would be happy to pray with you. If you're new to Koinonia, we just want to welcome you and you could head to kcf.life and fill out a digital connect form and someone from our team would love to get in touch with you. Well, it's time to engage in worship together.
are my sanctuary, my upper room. So I'll linger here with you. Push through the fear of silence till time has been removed. You are my sanctuary. My upper room, so I'll linger here with you. In my dwelling place where I am safe, I refuge from the storm. Open my heart to hear your.
Paul's letter to the Romans, he says this, God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. This love that is given through the Holy Spirit is our wellspring of life. It never runs out. It never runs dry. It fills us up. 
This wellspring of God's love is filled with healing and with breakthrough. And this wellspring of God's love is where we turn for prayer. Would you pray with me this morning in your homes? God, we welcome you. You are our wellspring. And we are thankful that we have your Holy Spirit as our wellspring that never runs dry, that fills us up. And Father, this morning as a church community, we lift each other up to you. We are praying for somebody who suffered a stroke. God, that you would be with them, that you would comfort them and bring them peace and healing. We're praying for somebody else who has been diagnosed with heart disease. God, would you be with him with his family, Father. May he draw on your wellspring of life in this time. God, we're praying for those recovering from surgery. We're praying for sore backs. We're lifting up kidney stones. God, we're lifting up those in our community who are struggling with loneliness. Today, God, we invite your wellspring to fill up those individuals, to bring healing, to bring breakthrough, to bring peace. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, welcome to church today. I'm so glad you're joining us. My name is Nick, and I'm thankful that you are here with us today. I want to let you know that we are celebrating. Look, we like to pray as a church. We believe that prayer is powerful, and we want to bring our requests, and we also want to celebrate the things that God does. Somebody let me know this week that one of their three things they're praying for in 2021 has been answered already. Isn't that incredible? We want to celebrate those things, and I share it with you so that it inspires your faith. It challenges you to continue to pray, continue to go deeper, continue to get close to God. I want to take a moment to talk about giving, to talk about worshiping God through our generosity. One of the things that Jesus said, his, his really close friend, John, quotes it for us. And Jesus said this, the world will know that you are my disciples by the way that you love one another. This is a challenging statement, but I'm confident that as a church, you have embraced this statement. Today, I get to share with you what you as a church accomplished through your love in action, through your financial generosity, through the families and organizations that we partnered with in the Christmas season to bless financially. Let me read you some of the initiatives and organizations and some of the amounts that, that you as a church gave through your generosity and love in action. And when I'm done, then you can celebrate with your families, give a little cheer, give a clap for all that God is doing through us. So through our Christmas blessing, we were able to give $10,600. Through Operation Christmas Child, we, we gave 43 full shoe boxes, plus all of those that were filled out online as well. We were able to bless our friends at Ray of Hope with 155 Christmas stockings, full of all the things that you need to celebrate Christmas. On Christmas Eve, we partnered with the Coping Center, and we were able to bless them with $6,000. And lastly, we were able to give over 40 care packages to those who were grieving and those who were isolated during the Christmas season. This is incredible. Take a moment right now on the couch in the kitchen and celebrate what God has done through his church. This is amazing. This is love in action. I share these numbers with you today because they represent people. They represent breakthrough. They represent lives changed and they represent love in action. Thank you for partnering with us to use what God has placed in your hands to bless and serve those around us. I wanna challenge you today at some point to pray this prayer. Holy Spirit, thank you for what you have placed in my hands. How can I worship you with it through generosity? Let's pray together. God, thank you for the incredible work that you are able to do through our generosity. As we worship you with our giving, with what you have placed in our hands, God, we trust that you are going to use it to build your kingdom and to impact the world with the love of Jesus. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you so much, Koinonia, for partnering with us. If you would like to find out more about how or where to give, you can head to kcf.life slash give. Let Jesus lead you towards generous love in action.
Well, good morning, church. It's great to be sharing the Word of God with you this morning. And today, I get to start our series on the study of the book of James. And James is one of the most practical books in the Bible. It's all about how our faith in Jesus gets worked out in our lives. It's direct, it's concise, moves quickly from one point to the other, and it also uses vivid word pictures, illustrations, metaphors that help us understand the teaching and remember it as well. You know, when um, we look at the book of James, it's important for us to understand that it's actually a letter. Like many of the New Testament books, it's a letter. And I want, to th- I want you to think about this for a moment. Let's say that I wrote you a letter, about five, six pages long. And then about 2,000 years from now, somebody picked up that letter, picked up page three of that letter, and began to read and started focusing in on the sentences on page three. Can you see how, if somebody did that, there would be a good chance that they would misunderstand or misinterpret what I was trying to explain to you, what I was trying to communicate to you. And it's similar when we look at the Word of God. In the New Testament, these these letters and books, they're around 2,000 years old, and we need to consider who the author is. We need to consider who the recipients are. We need to consider the situation going on around the audience and the person sending and writing that letter. So we're going to focus on that this morning as we prepare our hearts to receive everything that God wants us to from this amazing book. So let's look at the author first of all. It's interesting that unlike some of the other authors of the New Testament letters and books, James doesn't really say, give himself a title. He doesn't have any special title. It's just James. And that implies, that suggests that the people he's sending this letter to know him well. He has no need to introduce himself with any particular title. The early church uh, fathers and historians identified that James, the brother of Jesus, was the one who wrote this uh, letter. And the book of Acts tells us that after Peter left Jerusalem and was founding new churches, that James rose to a place of prominence, even leading the church in Jerusalem. And you can find that in Acts 12 and 15 and in Acts uh, chapter 21 as well. You can read more about that. Paul shows James honor and respect. He refers to him as being among the apostles. He talks about him being a pillar in the church in Jerusalem. And scholars believe that this book was written around 45 to 48 AD, which makes it one of, if not the oldest letter, the oldest book in the New Testament. It's often referred to as a general epistle or a general letter, and the reason for that is because it wasn't written to one specific church. It was written to a group of churches. It was actually addressed primarily to the Jewish Christians who had been scattered or dispersed throughout the area outside of the land of Israel. And it's actually possible that this dispersion, this scattering happened as a result of the persecution of Stephen. And you can read about that in Acts 8. Listen to it, verses 1 through 3. On that day, this is right after Stephen had been stoned to death, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him, but Saul, also known as Paul, began to destroy the church, going from house to house, dragging off both men and women and putting them in prison. So based on what the um, contents of this letter are, we can tell that these Jewish believers in Jesus the Messiah were probably experiencing poverty and they were experiencing various kinds of trials and oppression. And James addresses them as a concerned pastor. 
And he urges them and he encourages them to endure what they're going through patiently and faithfully, knowing that Jesus, their deliverer, would ultimately rescue them and judge their oppressors. And James is also concerned because the believers he's writing to have allowed themselves to be influenced by the unbelieving world around them. We see this in chapter 4. And so he's concerned about this, and he urges them to draw near to God with humble and repentant hearts, to turn to him, to be different from the world around them, not to love the world, but to have a fully devoted heart for Jesus. And for those who have wandered from Christ, to call them back to faith and repentance. There are two key influences that we see in the book as we look at the content. The first one is that James is filled with references, quotes, and imagery from the Old Testament. And Proverbs 1 through 9 is particularly influential. But the, probably the thing that influences James the most that we see in this book is the teaching of Jesus, specifically how Jesus described life in the kingdom of God, how he described that we as believers are to live in this new kingdom that we have been translated into, rescued from the kingdom of darkness, from the world around us that James was warning um, these believers in Christ about in, in uh, James 4. He's, he's rescued us out of this worldly system, placed us in his kingdom, and Jesus talks about what life in that kingdom looks like, and James expounds on it. In fact, there are at least 12 references to the Sermon on the Mount and Jesus' teachings. This is fascinating. James um, had written this book, remember, around 45 to 48 AD, which is well before Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So those places where the Sermon on the Mount were recorded in those Gospels have not been written yet. And scholars look at this and some of them believe that it's because James himself witnessed personally Jesus' teachings. And so he's been saturated in these teachings. They've been internalized inside of him and he is urging believers to practically apply these truths and implications of the gospel in their everyday life. So what is James wanting to accomplish? What is his purpose? He wants these believers to walk in true wisdom. He talks about wisdom as a theme in this book. And he is suggesting that true wisdom is not of this earth. True wisdom comes from above. It comes from the teachings of Christ. And when we walk in true wisdom, what we're doing is we're putting them into practice in our lives. That summary that Jesus gave of the Torah of loving God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving our neighbors as ourselves. He doesn't want these believers just to know and just hear and know and believe intellectually what Jesus has said or what the gospel is about. He actually wants them to live it. There are many famous verses in the book of James about this idea of not just having a faith that's intellectual. You know, I believe in Jesus. He says, even the demons believe. Believing isn't enough. Not believing in your head. It's a, it's a conviction in the heart that transforms us into people that live out of that faith. That's what he's challenging us to do. In the 108 verses that make up the book of James, there are 54 imperatives or commands or calls to action. James was a man of action, and he wants us as believers to put our faith into action. But he's not just barking orders. He comes with a pastoral heart, and he calls the readers 15 times, my beloved brothers and sisters, my brothers. He, he's, he's got this heart for these people. He loves them because he's their pastor. Some people have misunderstood the book of James, and they have seen it as a legalistic book, one that's focused more on doing than believing in the grace of God. But that's not at all true. It's not at all true. James is writing to believers 
who have already understood and received the gospel. And he is showing them, reminding them what a life transformed and empowered by the grace of the gospel looks like. That's what he's doing. And Acts 15, if we have any questions about this, confirms that James is not a legalist. A legalist is somebody who believes that our law-keeping and our works are the cause or the root of our salvation. That's not what James believes at all. Remember, he's one of the leaders, if not the leader in Jerusalem at this time. And what's happening is something new. The Gentiles, non-Jews, are beginning to come to faith in Jesus Christ. And this is exciting, but for the Jewish, Jewish believers, they're, they're uncertain what to do with this. And so it's causing issues because they're not sure how to disciple them, what to tell them they need to do as followers of Jesus. So there's Jewish believers who are beginning to teach these Gentiles that they need to be circumcised and they need to follow the law of Moses in order to be saved. And so Paul and Barnabas and others are concerned about this. They go to Jerusalem, and this is where something called the Jerusalem Council takes place. Paul and Barnabas begin to tell the apostles there exactly what's been happening, how God has been doing signs and wonders among the Gentiles, how they've been coming to Christ. And after all of this happens, James stands up, and it says this. When they finished in Acts 15... Verse 13, James spoke up. Brothers, he said, listen to me. Simon has described, that's Peter, to us how God first intervened to choose a people for his name from the Gentiles. The words of the prophets are in agreement with this. And then he begins to quote them. And then he says, it is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. And then he gives four things that he believes represent and accurately reflect the heart of God for them, that they should abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from the meat of strangled animals, and from blood. Those are, that's it. And this letter gets sent out to the Gentile believers, and they rejoice. You know, if James was legalistic, if he believed that in order to be saved, we have to keep the law of Moses as Christians, that that's the basis of our salvation, he had the authority and the opportunity to settle the dispute by telling everybody that, but he didn't. He recognized, just like Paul, that salvation comes by grace through faith. And he affirms this in Acts 15. However, in James' uh, epistle, in the letter he wrote, he wanted to explain and clarify what the nature of this kind of faith that saves is like. He emphasizes that true faith in Jesus not only saves us and makes us right with God, but it also transforms us and produces in us a desire to obey the revealed will of God. And in the context of this book, as I said, he's expounding on the teachings of Jesus. And so he's saying, if you've got a true faith in Jesus, you're going to want to live according to the teachings of Jesus. And to be clear, he's, he's not saying that this obedience is the root or the cause of our salvation. He is saying it is the fruit, the result of a heart that has been transformed by believing in Jesus by grace through faith. So James wants not just true wisdom, but he wants us to have true faith as well. And he shows us how the Christian faith and love expresses itself in real life situations. He talks about what it looks like in trials and temptations, in rejecting prejudice and judging others. He talks about how it affects the words we speak how we relate to money and possessions, how we relate to difficulties and hardships, and how it causes us to come to God in prayer. And these are things that the Holy Spirit is emphasizing for us as well as a church family. So we're excited about diving into the book of James so that we can have an experience with Jesus and be transformed as our roots go deep into God's word this year. 
So those are some of the themes we're going to be looking at. True wisdom, true wisdom, true faith, true maturity, among others as well. But as we prepare to look at an application for our time together this morning, I want us to take a look at James 1, verse 1. This is what it says. James, a servant of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that may not seem too profound to you, but let me show you how profound it really is. James grew up in the same family as Jesus, in the same house. Can you imagine growing up in the same household as Jesus? Throughout his ministry, throughout Jesus' ministry, James did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. We find out at near the beginning of Jesus' ministry in Mark 3.21 that his family went to take charge of Jesus because they thought he was out of his mind. That's his own family, including James, thought that. Then near the end of Jesus' ministry in John 7 verse 5, it says that even his own brothers did not believe in him. So in this letter, as it opens, James calls his brother Lord and Christ. He has become the leader of the church in Jerusalem, and in 62 AD, just over around 20 years, just over 20 years after he's written this letter, he gives his life for the Lord Jesus Christ. What happened? How did this man go from thinking that Jesus Christ was crazy and not believing in him to believing that he was the Lord and Christ and even giving his life for him, for his faith in Jesus? What made James change? What changed his mind? Well, Peter gives us some, or uh, Paul gives us some insight in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 7. It says that after Jesus was raised from the dead, he showed himself to about 500 people, but he also showed himself to his brother, to James. And the resurrected Jesus, having that encounter with him, transformed James' life. It transformed his heart, it transformed his belief, and because of that experience, James went from not believing in his, in his brother as the Lord and Savior of the world to being willing to give his life for him. That's profound, and I want to suggest to you this morning that the resurrection of Jesus not only transformed James, but it transforms us too. Today, Right where you are, wherever you're watching this, the resurrection of Jesus Christ can transform you. The Bible tells us that if it weren't for the resurrection of Jesus, just a few verses later in 1 Corinthians 15, 17, if it weren't for the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we would still be on our sins. In other words, because of Jesus' resurrection, we are forgiven but then we find out in Romans 4.25, it's because of the resurrection of Jesus that we are made right with God. It wasn't just his death on the cross that secured our salvation. The resurrection was necessary too. In Romans 1, it tells us that it was through the resurrection that God declared Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit to be the Son of God in power. And then it's through the resurrection, because of the res resurrection, that we can have a new life in Jesus Christ. Romans 6 tells us this, verse 3 and 4. Do you not know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore, listen to this, this is powerful, we were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ 
was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, through the power of the Holy Spirit, we too may live a new life. See, the, the kind of life that James is describing in his letter is not a life that is possible in our own strength. James knew this. It is possible only through the power of the Holy Spirit and an encounter with Jesus Christ. Remember the video that introduced um, this message? Here's what it says. No amount of work, trying, effort, or striving will give life to our faith. It is only through an encounter with Jesus Christ. It's through Jesus and through his resurrection that we are empowered and transformed and equipped to live the kind of life that James is talking about in his letter. Now, you don't need, I don't need to physically see the resurrected Christ in order to be transformed by his resurrection. The Holy Spirit reveals Jesus, the resurrected Lord and Savior, to our hearts. And he does that through worship, like we've been experiencing this morning. He does it through the Word of God. He does it as we're in prayer. He reveals Jesus to us. And when we believe, like James did, everything changes. Our hearts are made new and we are set free from the slavery and control of sin, and we are liberated into a new life with Jesus Christ, equipped to live like citizens of the kingdom of heaven. That's what the resurrection does for us. So the resurrection of Jesus transforms us, but I want to take a look at one more application for us this morning. I want you to look at how James identifies himself and also how he doesn't. Both are important. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now that title, servant of God, that's a common title throughout the New Testament letters. Even in the Old Testament, we see people called a servant of God. Moses, uh, Jeremiah, David, Amos. But this full title, the way it's given here, it's the only place in the New Testament that it occurs. So it's important. James is using it for a reason. Listen to it again. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know about you, but this strikes me as a little bit strange. And here's why. Remember who James is. He's the brother of Jesus. Now, I would be tempted to, to uh, put a plug in there for my status as the brother of Jesus. You know, Nathan, a brother of Jesus. That has a nice ring to it, doesn't it? I'm, it's surprising that he wouldn't do that. But here's the thing. There's a reason. James knew that being physically related to Jesus didn't give him authority to speak the way he did, to write the way he did. His authority came from his spiritual relationship with Jesus. Look at the words that James chooses to use. He calls himself a servant. It could also be translated a slave. He considers himself a servant of Jesus Christ. In other words, he belongs to Jesus Christ. Why? Because he has a revelation, like the Apostle Peter described, that he has been purchased with the precious blood of Jesus. And then he says he's not only a servant, but he's a servant of the Lord. This is how people referred to the God of the universe. And it's a way of saying, my master. He's identified not only that he's a servant, but who he's serving. He's got loyal allegiance to Jesus Christ, his Lord and Savior, and to God the Father. And then he says Jesus, which means Jehovah is salvation, and then Christ. <laughs> Jesus' own brother recognizes that Jesus is the Christ. 
In other words, he is the promised Messiah that has been prophesied about for hundreds and thousands of years in the Old Testament. He looks at his resurrected brother and he says, you are the Christ. Now, I don't know about you, but my siblings are some of the people that know me best on the face of this earth. And to me, this is strong evidence of the fact that Jesus Christ really is who he says he is. If his own brother can look at him and say, I am your servant, you are the Lord Jesus Christ, that is profound. So spiritual realities are what defined James' identity and status, not the fact that he was his brother, Jesus' brother. James James saw being a servant of his Lord and Savior as a greater status than any claim to fame that he might have from being Jesus' earthly brother. In light of his spiritual relationship with Jesus, his earthly one wasn't even worth bringing up. How does this apply to us? Our relationship with Jesus defines us too. Because of our faith in Jesus, we have a new identity. We are children of God. And actually, if you want to know, spiritually speaking, we share the same Father. And Jesus himself referred to the fact that we are his brothers and sisters. Wow. It doesn't matter what family background you come from. It doesn't matter what socioeconomic background you come from. It doesn't matter what accomplishments you may have in life. The greatest thing that can be said about you is that you are a child of God. And that was made possible through your relationship with Jesus Christ. But then, like James, we can say the same thing, that we are servants of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ. James saw himself as a servant, and he saw that as an honor to be a servant of Jesus. How do you view being a servant of Jesus? Does that somehow sound like a demotion? It's not. Being a servant of Jesus Christ is a profound privilege. What does it mean? It means that my life is dedicated to seeing Jesus' will accomplished in this earth. What a privilege. Remember who you're serving. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. What a privilege that we have. So I want to ask you this question. What is it? that you are using to define your identity, status, and value? Are you using the same filters that the world around us uses? Are you, do you look at your position in life, the power that you have, the possessions that you can call your own, or do you look to what God says about who you are? Do you look to the identity that you have been given because of your relationship with Jesus Christ? That today is where we need to find our identity. The resurrection transforms us and our identity in Christ defines us. I trust that this morning you will choose to believe those two truths that we see are evident in the life of James. Maybe this morning you have not yet received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Maybe this morning as I've been sharing these truths with you, the Holy Spirit has begun to reveal Jesus to you. Maybe you are beginning to see that He is the resurrected Lord and Savior of the universe. And if that's the case, I want to help you express that faith in Jesus Christ. The Bible says when we surrender to Him as Lord and Savior, that we are saved, that our sins are forgiven, we're made right with God, 
and we are given this new identity that I've talked about. So I would love to help you to express your faith. I'm gonna pray a simple prayer. The specific words that I pray are not necessarily the ones you need to pray. These are just a reflection of your own faith in Jesus Christ. And so I encourage you to just repeat them after me. Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your Son, Jesus Christ, for me. Thank you, Jesus, for laying down your life on the cross for my sin. I believe you died so I could be forgiven, so I could be made right with you. And I believe that God raised you from the dead to be my King, to be my Lord, and to be my Savior. My trust and my hope is in you. Amen. Well, if you prayed that prayer, if you meant it from your heart, if you have surrendered your life to Jesus, this is a new day for you. And like James, you can begin to call yourself a servant of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ. I encourage you to let somebody know. If you're viewing online, just click on the live prayer button and let one of our hosts know about your decision. We would love to support you in your journey of faith. We'd love to pray with you because this is just the beginning. Amen. Have a great week. Thank you for joining us for church. We're so glad that we could be part of your weekend. If you're new to Koinonia or you've been here for a while and you've not yet connected to a group, you can join us on Sunday mornings at 11.15 a.m. for Connect Room. There are hosts there waiting to meet you. And if you would like to join, you can go to kcf.life. Well, we enjoyed Zoom prayer meetings, the week of prayer and fasting so much that we are going to continue on with Zoom prayer ongoing through the week. To learn more about when prayer is happening, you can find that information at kcf.life. Thank you for joining us and we will see you again soon. Bye.